It's the beginning of the Empire era. Clone troopers, once prominent figures, have sadly slipped into obscurity for many. They are now regarded as relics of a bygone era. Yet amidst this perceived irrelevance, something significant unfolds at the secret Imperial stronghold known as Mount Tantis. Welcome to the third part of the series that delves into the clone troopers overarching story. Check out the other two videos if you haven't already. Under the sinister leadership of Dr. Hemlock, the clones find themselves subjected to injustice once more. As season 3 of The Bad Batch kicks off, viewers witness Omega, Crosser and numerous other clones enduring suffering. This time they are confined like animals, trapped within cages, serving as test subjects for an unknown purpose. Yet while it might seem like Omega and the newly introduced female clone called Dr. Emery Carr have it easier than others, everyone is restricted within these walls. Good morning, Omega. How are you feeling today? Like a prisoner. I want to leave. Everywhere the story takes you, the Empire's destructive, evil and selfish habits can be seen. Like in the episode called Paths Unknown, when we meet young clone cadets that has been left stranded on this dangerous planet called Cetra. It's clear that the clones no longer are looked upon as individuals we know they are. Rather, they are experimental assets or just nobodies. The only clone that seems to have any sort of real significance is Omega. And and by the end of the third episode called The Shadow of Tantis, we sort of understand why. Stop! Don't shoot them down. What? The clone sample supported a positive M count transfer with no degradation from the specimen. But sir, they're escaping. Stand down. We need her alive. Now! With Omega, Batcher, and Crosser escaping Tantis, it gets revealed that her blood could transfer midichlorians. That's at least how I understand it. Nevertheless, what's important is the fact that Omega needs to be alive. That she is important for the future of Palpatine's grand plan of cloning force-sensitive beings, and as we witness in episode 9, eventually himself. Whatever is needed to accomplish this goal, you will have it. What's intriguing is that Nala Say, someone who has been deeply involved in the cloning process from its very beginning, engineered a clone with such unique attributes. The big confusion is obviously why the Kaminoans did this. Was it a mere coincidence or were they engaged in some clandestine experiment? The questions are undoubtedly many and Nala Say doesn't really give us an answer to this in the series either, making it a mystery. That result is nothing but an an aberration, like the clone herself. Another aspect of the cloning program briefly seen in Season 2 were the CX Troopers, mind-controlled brutal assassins that once were normal clones but now served Dr. Hemlock and the Empire. It's one of those shadows we keep running into. Very similar to Crosser in the beginning of Season 1, these shadows are exactly like robots, no free will at all, even killing themselves instead of giving up information. It's such a contrast to the rest of the clones still alive, and it's very sad to see some of them turn out this way. It's certainly not something they wanted, but not all of them managed to resist the harsh treatment like for instance Crosser apparently did. Their identities? are erased. They undergo conditioning. The few that make it through come out different. In the episodes titled Infiltration and Extraction, we get to experience quite a nostalgia trip. Located on the planet Tef, that first made its appearance in the iconic Clone Wars movie from 2008, we find a small operation of clones, including Rex, Hauser, and Echo. It truly puts everything in perspective. That back when Rex, Anakin, and Ahsoka set foot inside this temple, it was the beginning of the war, and the beginning of the clones era in Star Wars. Now, approximately 16 years later, the few clones that are still alive reunite at the very same place, each with their own story and their own mistakes. Remember me? Surprised I'm alive? 
Most of my squad from Ryloth is dead because of you. What made these episodes truly exceptional was their portrayal of each clone's unique point of view. For example, that Captain Hauser's resentment towards Crosshair stemmed from his actions on Ryloth. Similarly, characters like Commander Wolf remained unaware of the Empire's true intentions, highlighting the vastness of this organization's influence. That despite the widespread implementation of the Stormtrooper program and the Empire's control over the clones, Wolfie remains steadfastly loyal, obedient to the commands he received. But even if this commander remained on the Empire's side, it existed a clear difference between him and the likes of the CX troopers. Want to tell me why this spire is burning when our primary objective is to retrieve the target unharmed? You could still recognize the individualism in Commander Wolf, the moral compass most clones grew to create. He still seemed like a good soldier. He followed the Empire orders because he thought it was the right thing to do. And on one hand, you could draw comparisons to Cody, who also remained loyal to the Empire until it became evident that their actions were evil. That specific moment had probably not happened for Wolf yet. Or perhaps it occurred towards the conclusion of these episodes, when he encountered the insurgents he desperately had tried to catch. Wolf. Rex. You can help us. You can stand with us. I am a soldier of the Empire. As your brother, I'm asking you to do the right thing. It showcases, like I have said many times before in these videos, that the clone bond is something special. That they don't have to agree, but they always have each other's back. And it's summed up perfectly in the last conversation between Wolf and the Commando. But sir, uh, the traitors. Perhaps. But they're clones. We owe them that. The back half of season 3 is very much a conclusion to the story of the Bad Batch, and along with the fate of the clones, their journey leads back to where the season kicked off, and that's Mount Tantis. We get to, more closely than ever before, follow Emery in her process of slowly coming to terms with that she, as many others, doesn't like Hemlock's methods. Omega has undoubtedly had a big effect on her mentality, as this unique clone seems to have on many people, including Cross. Her. You're as bad as Hunter. Oh, I'm much worse. What I like about Dr. Carr is that she provides another perspective on the clone's story as a scientist tasked with testing and creating them. It's a twisted fate, inherently sad and tragic, yet it reflects the reality of every clone's fate, each designed with a unique purpose, whether it be for war, production, or something entirely. Different. You don't have to do this. I'm sorry, but I do. With Omega, along with Force-sensitive children, a Silo Beast, and numerous other clones trapped on Mount Antis, the Bad Batch faced a daunting task in rescuing them, and it all came together in the series finale. Although not unfolding as I anticipated it, it was fantastic for many reasons. For instance, it showcased the exceptional abilities of this unique squad, while also portraying a small clone rebellion, as fans had been eager anticipating. Are you joking? The wisest course of action is to leave while we can. Clones don't leave our brothers behind. Echo is a clone that I personally think has been underused in this series, but the finale did a phenomenal job of letting this ARC trooper shine. Despite being present since the early stages of Clone Wars, Echo's unique backstory and capabilities were often sidelined. His appearance and actions in the final episodes was thus immensely satisfying, because we finally got shown why he is such a skilled trooper that has survived so many years, and the brilliantly honorable personality that comes with it. You're a clone. How can you be part of this? Omega saw something in you. 
I want to believe that she was right. This escape and uprising marks the clones' swan song, as they unite not only to aid each other, but also to sabotage the base and its research in the process. Even if it's only a handful that actually survived the destruction of Mount Tantis, it's such a testament to what an united force could achieve, that they could take down one of the Empire's most important projects all on their own, a program that has hurt so many clones in different ways. It's truly an excellent conclusion from various perspectives, with Crosser finally hitting his mark, Emery switching sides, Omega imparting her knowledge to the kids, Echo evolving into his own character, and the clones last hurrah, together and united. But as they jump into hyperspace, a lingering question still remains. What do they do now? Today in 2024, the clones are everywhere in Star Wars. They have become a central piece of the universe, making appearances in everything from Kenobi to Book of Boba Fett to Star Wars Rebels. Whilst the overarching story of these soldiers ended in the Bad Batch, these individuals lived on, spread out in the universe. Some of them kept fighting in the rebellion, like Echo, Rex, Wolf, Gregor and Omega. Some of them decided to live the rest of their lives in peace, like Crosser, Wrecker and Hunter, and some of them tragically never managed to get the life they deserved. Help a veteran get a warm meal. Even if it's nice to see some of the clones get to determine what they fight for, their story will always be imprinted by a life with hardly no choice. Put in an almost impossible position of fighting a war they never understood, being pawns in a much more complex game designed by the evil Sith. If they would have been mindless beings, I wouldn't have cared as much. But what Clone Wars and Bad Batch manage to do with their characters is the definition of a two-edged sword, in that they both enhance the story of Star Wars while also making it so much more tragic. The clones individualism is what made me fall in love with their story, and their different and fun identities is why they will always be remembered. I also want to highlight D. Bradley Baker, the voice actor that portrayed every single clone in animation. The work he has done is beyond phenomenal, and it wouldn't have been possible to create all of this without him. And that's it, the final part of the clone story comes to an end. If you want to watch more Star Wars videos, why don't you click on this one, and let me know if you want me to do more videos like these ones. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you will have a great day.